Oh, how about that? Okay, so so this morning's message is just for the students. The rest of you can sit back, go to sleep, and relax, and pretend that you're just not here, okay? (laughs) Maybe not. (laughs) Students, how many of you are familiar with the Cadet Code of Honor? There are different codes, by the way, right? Okay, Air Force Academy has one, Naval Academy has one, West Point has one, I'm sure Coast Guard has, I didn't check them all out, but, um, but there's a code of honor, right? This happens to be the U.S. Air Force code of honor. Uh, I put it up because it'll all fit on one screen. Um, some of the others are just slightly longer. Uh, in fact, uh, I want you to think about that. West Point, a cadet will not lie, cheat, steal, listen to this, or tolerate those who do. Naval Academy, midshipmen are persons of integrity. And listen to these different phrases. Persons of integrity. We stand for that which is right. We tell the truth and ensure that the full truth is known. We do not lie. We embrace fairness in all actions. We ensure that work submitted as our own is our own and that assistance received from any source is authorized and properly documented. We do not cheat. We respect the property of others and ensure that others are able to benefit from the use of their own property. We do not steal. In notes regarding the Air Force, um, Cadet Honor Code. We will not lie, steal, or cheat, nor tolerate anyone among us who does. The bedrock of moral and character education at the United States Air Force Academy begins with an internalization of the Cadet Honor Code. This code was created by cadets and is owned by cadets. They are responsible for maintaining the code as well as for the process by which those who break it are assessed. The code is based on a fundamental positive principles of honesty, respect, fairness, and support. We will not lie, steal, or cheat, nor tolerate anyone among us, anyone who does. So, students, are you committed to that code? And why? Why are you committed to that code when you realize there are more than one case in which sometimes a a whole class has gotten information and shared it with one another? What if you're that one person who didn't get that information? Wouldn't you want to get in on it? And why wouldn't you? I mean, isn't it fair to be with the rest of the class, to to have the same information they all have? That's what the preparation's about, isn't it? A fairness, a knowledge, an understanding of of what the class is being taught and the principles, and so that when you take the test, you're not just regurgitating, but you've actually learned something. And, And it surely would be unfair if one person got information that the rest didn't get. Wouldn't that be unfair? There's a test, isn't there? And why does it matter as to whether you hold to that test? I mean, in fact, if you cheat and no one else finds out, then does it really matter? Is there anything really wrong with that? (laughs) They're all like, are we allowed to say yes? There's something wrong with it? Because I'm thinking that's wrong. It's still wrong. (laughs) They want to nod, but they want to get in trouble saying no with the pastor because he's called sir, right? (laughs) Oh, goody. Thank you. And that's a, that's a part of it, isn't it? Because this is not about excelling based on what somebody else does. And really, isn't the code of honor about something much deeper and much more important? The code of honor is about trust. It's about a trust that you're going to put in one another. And if you get out of there on the battlefield and you're serving next to another soldier, another officer, and you know that they cheated on a test, how confident are you going to be in their integrity on that battlefield? You see, 
The military is dependent upon us trusting one another, our leaders and our comrades in that battlefield. And if you know that you have somebody on your team that's dishonest. Well, they just cheated on a test. I mean, they just, you know, I mean, they just quoted somebody else. They just used somebody else's paper. It was just, they were so tired. I mean, if you're willing to start bending the rule there, so to speak, if you're willing to give in to integrity at any point, then how can you trust your fellow soldier out there on the battlefield where it really matters? Where cowardice will cost the life of others. Yeah, trust. It matters, doesn't it? Behavior, integrity. And did you see some of those that were listed up there? You know, it, it, don't they sound a little familiar to some other principles I've heard somewhere? I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's like, it's like Exodus or Deuteronomy or some books like that. And, and, and there's these like, I think there's 10 of them, aren't there? <laughs> and they, they kind of talk about some stuff like that. Uh, the, the, the commands of God. Oh, but, but those are in the Old Testament, so, so we don't really need to deal with them anymore, right? Because Jesus took care of them, correct? Oh, no, 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 no. No, no. Jesus fulfilled what they required. And he modeled for us the ability to fulfill them by being perfect. And then he invites us now not to just give up on them, but that through him to live them. Okay, but not to also somehow always to be put in this kind of, you know, well, did I follow it with uh, the fly and the dot and the tittle and all those extra rules and principles I put on in addition to the 10? You see, the 10 are keys to life. They're not suggestions, incidentally, and they didn't get ended when Jesus died. They're still there and they're still meaningful. And that's why Jesus said, look, let me explain. The greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the first four of the Ten Commandments are all about loving God. Wait a second. So Jesus is saying we got a hold to the first four? Okay. Yes, we do. But almost without breath, I think, I, I think if you were listening to Jesus, because remember, he's responding to the question of a, of a lawyer, incidentally, <laughs> And the lawyer who really knows the law says, you know, tell me what's the most important. He wants the single most important of the ten. Now, good lawyers back in Jesus' day said that the most important one was remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And they wrote about, what was it, hundreds of pages about how to remember the Sabbath. And so he's like, well, you're going to say keep the Sabbath holy. And Jesus says, no, the, the, the number one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And without stopping, because he knows the lawyer is ready just to go on, because now he got one done. No, no, he says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes on and says, and these summarize the law. And guess what the attorney says? Good job, Jesus. <laughs> you got the law right. That's really true. The first four commandments talk about loving God with everything that you have, and the second six commandments talk about our relationship with one another, and that's the code of honor, isn't it? I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to cheat. Uh, I'm not going to honor those that do. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to see that life is fair. I'm going to do what's right. Well, I've got a code of honor for you this morning. It's from Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Excuse me, verses one through four. Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking which are out of place but rather thanksgiving we uh, have presented a statement on marriage and really it's more than that it's probably could be well in fact I probably should back up and say that our association of churches has a declaration of human sexuality on the church and in it, 
it states a lot of things that we have put in that statement on marriage that's in your worship bulletin again this morning. The piece of it that we're looking at today is we believe that any form of sexual immorality, any form, including adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism, bisexual conduct, bestiality, incest, pornography, and attempt, attempting to change one's biological sex or otherwise acting upon any disagreement with one's biological sex is sinful and offensive to God. Now let me take you back to Ephesians 5. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Paul says the first piece of our code as Christians is follow God's example. Follow God's example. You are loved. This is something ex extremely incredible. You are loved the way you are. You are loved by God. You are children of God. First Corinthians, Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. The word here, for example, says imitate God. Now again, as you heard me hopefully in my prayer, we're not saying pretend to be God because you're not. <laughs> but to imitate it's like the little child. How many commercials have you seen like this? Right? The little child is doing the things that daddy's doing. Okay? And so, so daddy's running, so the little kid's running, right? Daddy's pretending to shave, so the little kid's shaving. Daddy starts smoking, so the little kid starts smoking. Whatever, right? I mean, have you seen those commercials? They're following the example of dad because little kids want to be like dad. <laughs> we, little children, want to be like dad. And Paul says the first part of our code is to imitate God the Father. Become like him. And, and he describes that. Because you are loved, love others like God loves us. And how did he do that? Well, he gave us Christ. And, and, he, and Christ gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and as a sacrifice to God. He actually submits to God. And so we, because we love God, we want to submit to God as well. We want to surrender to him. Follow God's example. Secondly, he says, walk in the way of love. The second part of our code of honor is to walk in the way of love. And now he describes that. He says that's being different than the world does it. Ooh, and he gives some tough stuff here, doesn't he? So I guess this was working so I could look at it once in a while, huh? Okay, it's going to stay small. Walk in the way of love. Be different from the way the world, the way the world loves. Be different from the way you were when you came to Christ. When you came to Christ, uh, were, were you perfect? Probably not. <laughs> I still love what, um, what um, John Wimber said. And, and Wimber was uh, leading uh, or participating in a lot of people coming to know Christ. And he was attending this friend's church. And the friend's church was pretty traditional. <laughs> and... and um, well, I, see, I remember even visiting the Friends Church and thinking it was down in Yorba Linda, actually. And he's, he's bringing people to Christ. And this was back in a day that, that didn't look like our day today, okay? If you had tats, you were a little bit unusual. <laughs> uh, you were a little bit different. And he started bringing people to Christ and to the church. And guess what? He, as people were coming, they, they were coming. And he said, like, they were people that were actually cussing and stuff like that who had just become Christians. A little bit strange and and the the, the, the people that are coming so they're doing things that and, and when and, and kind of start upsetting some of the traditional people with their behavior with their language can you imagine it you know somebody starts to pray and they and they use God's name somehow in vain or throw out some other worse word like that um, if that's what they've been used to saying it's probably gonna come out isn't it it's probably going to come out, isn't it? Well, that's what happened. And Wimber says, you know, I didn't know that I had to clean them. He's talking about the fish, right? 
I, I said, I didn't know that I had to clean them before I caught them. He started bringing people to church that weren't clean yet. Like all of us. Not a single one of us is clean when we come to Christ. But we're in the process of becoming like Christ. And so he says, look, I, I, I Walk in the way of love. Be different from the world. Be different from the way you were when you came, your, came to Christ. Give yourself up just like Christ gave himself up. Be willing to sacrifice yourself the way Jesus Christ sacrificed himself. And, and, and it changed. And, and, and there should be an obvious difference. In fact, near the end of the message, we're going to look at Romans. We're going to kind of walk through the book real fast. And, and Paul has some pretty clear things to say about lifestyle. Uh, in, in fact, I, I, I don't want to jump ahead. He says, and he goes on in the text, not only should you walk in the way of love, and, and love really should be the guiding principle, right? But remember, sometimes love has to be tough, doesn't it? So you have the person in your family who's becoming addicted to drugs. And what should you do if you're going to love them tough? Well, you enable them, right? Well, I'm, I, you know, it's tough that you're like that, but let me help you have some more because it'll make you feel better. Besides, you're a nicer person on the drugs than you are off, and so you know, don't really like you that other way, so here, we'll just enable you. And, and the, here's the sad thing is a lot of families enable the addictions of fem members of the family. And here's the challenging one, though, is when you have to love with tough love. When you have to actually come to a person and say, you know, your behavior is messing up you and others, and we are not going to support the behavior anymore. In fact, and this is where you actually may actually have to step in and mediate that person's life and say, unless you change, you're not going to be able to live here any longer. Unless you're willing to go and deal with this addiction, we're not going to encourage your lifestyle any longer. You're going to be on your own. And parents who love with tough love who actually will discipline their child, may not be liked by their child. Have you noticed that? When that parent's trying to say no, the, the, the child may get real offended and real upset about it. In fact, the child may even holler things like, I hate you! I don't ever want to be around you anymore! You know, things like that, right? <laughs> and the parent who really loves them will do what? Not give in to the meanness that may come. Do you realize how hard that is? How many of you parents in the room have had teenagers? Okay, so you parents in the room who have teenagers, they did everything you asked them to do all the time, right? Yeah, you remember a moment when they said no? Oh, but they always said it Oh, no, Mom and Dad, I'm going to do what God says instead. <laughs> so it's not about you, Dad or Mom. I'm just doing something that's more right than what you're saying. That, that's, the way they, that's the way they did it, right? You know, hey, how many, how many people in the room were at some point teenagers and you rebelled? <laughs> just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just, yeah, just, just, yeah, just that, that wee tiny little bit, right? And the parent who loved you would still say no even though you didn't like them. Boy, and I can remember some moments like that. And we have two exceptional sons. I mean, they are honoring God in all kinds of ways, both of them serving the Lord, uh, but <laughs> they, and their, they and their dad weren't perfect. <laughs> Okay, and we had our moments. And I can remember some moments where I had to win. Parents, you know, you know those moments? You, you just have to win. So you're not going to give in even though it sure would be a lot easier and the house would be a lot quieter for the next few hours, right? But you have, you ha no, I'm not, I'm not going to give in. See, love, Hebrews says, the Father disciplines those he loves. The word of God is full of discipline. Jesus comes even, doesn't he, to what? 
I'm thinking he made disciples. Isn't that a similar word? To discipline, to teach, to model who God is and to help us to become like him. And he's going to speak to the religious and the unreligious. And he's going to help us all trying to say, look, are you becoming like me or not? And he's going to discipline us. And the Holy Spirit is going to do what? The Holy Spirit's going to do even more than that. The Holy Spirit's going to convict us, isn't the Holy Spirit? He's going to say, look, this is something that you shouldn't be doing. And you actually might feel embarrassed. You might feel shame. You may actually feel guilty. And one of our challenges is some of us are doing things to get rid of our guilt or get rid of the guilt of others and we do that when we say something is a sin is not a sin we're trying to get rid of the guilt we're trying to make it too easy we're trying to what not parent with real love and so Ephesians goes on But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place but rather thanksgiving. There should be no hint, no smell, no sense of sexual immorality. We could come up with a list, Paul does in other places, of some of the different forms of sexual immorality, but there should be no hint of it even. There should be no impurity, no lustful impurity, impure motives. Romans 1 says, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And there are all kinds of ways and you can see it. You can see it in Carl's Jr. commercials. (laughs) Sexual impurity that's being promoted throughout our culture. There shall be no Lustful, impure motives, no impurity, no, no hint of it even. There shall be no greed. This, and and he, this is that greedy desire to have more and more. Do you have enough yet, America? I mean, how wealthy do we have to be? How, how much money is enough money? To the greedy, there's never enough. I mean, come on. The fact is, is that there's not a person in this room who's poor in world standards. Now, I know some of you are, on financial, are financially challenged and all, but in the world standards, you are wealthy. How much more do you need? He says, don't be greedy. Don't desire to have more. Oh, that was the word from Exodus. Don't covet. He says, we, there should be no obscenity, no shameful, obscene conversation. Well, what's included in that? The things that I say that might be obscene, the things that, that, that I say that in my conversation is going to, be, is going to sound dirty to, to God. What are those things? He goes on, he says, there should be no foolish talk or coarse joking. Okay, that's kind of explaining it, isn't it? In fact, the word there is there should not even be any facetious jesting. Wow, we watch this with our youth group. There's a lot of jesting and teasing and pretending that some one child, one student or another is homosexual. That's not necessarily healthy, is it? To, to pretend to be something. It's, it's, a, it's a jesting. And, and do we ever do that in, in ways that hurt other people? Jest and pretend, joke around with somebody else, tell the off-color joke, whatever it might be. There should be no foolish talk or coarse joking. And there instead should be what? There should be thanksgiving. Now it's an interesting word. Because the word here, see if any of you recognize it. The the word for there should be thanksgiving is there should be eucharistia. 
there should be eucharistia. Eucharist. Have you heard that? The Eucharist. What is the Eucharist as we refer to it? Isn't the Eucharist communion when we remember the bread and the cup, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the payment that made? Why would it be called Eucharistia? Because we're supposed to be thankful for what Jesus Christ has done for us. He breaks the dividing wall. He cuts the curtain down. He opens the door to heaven so we can go in and know God because he died for what? Our sins. And that should make us what? Eucharistia. That should make us thankful. And we need to be thankful instead of giving in to various kinds of sin. So my question today is, are you living the honor code? So that's why I say this. This is just for the students, right? Are you living the honor code? Not borrowing something from someone else without telling them. Quoting it in your papers, right? Acknowledging that this is somebody else's quote. It's not just something you forgot, now, or didn't forgot that it came from someone else. You actually admit to it. You say that this is from them. Not cheating on any kind of a test. Not dishonoring anyone else. Not lying. Not stealing. Because you can steal people's thoughts as well as their things, correct? So you're going to, are you living the honor code? And when I say living it, are you imitating it or are you actually doing it? Are you pretending it? Because here's the thing. Have you ever been tempted? Maybe to be a little lazy with that report that you're working on? Ever, ever been tempted not to do everything the way God said to do something? Ever been tempted to sin? I'm thinking. Paul hasn't, so pray for him. <laughs> that he becomes human like the rest of us. <laughs> okay, are you living the honor code? Now, to live the honor code means that you're going to love. Did you know that in the honor code, that if somebody else is cheating and you find out about it, and you do nothing, you just broke the honor code? Did you know that, students? Did the rest of you know that? You find that somebody else is cheating and you do nothing about it, you are guilty of breaking the honor code. And if it's learned that you found out about it and did nothing about it and that person gets expelled, guess what's happening to you? Goodbye. Goodbye. You're going to suffer those same, same consequences because you knew and did nothing. I have to ask you, if we know that something is sin and we do nothing about it, are we guilty according to the honor code? Oh, that's tougher, Pastor Bill. You know, do you really have to put it on us? I mean, can't, I mean, I mean we're, we're not supposed to judge, right? Like, come on, Jesus said that. Don't judge lest you be judged. With the measure you judge, you shall be judged. And some of us can get rather critical and... Um, really be dissenting and get upset at what other people are doing. Well, but don't forget, how did it start out? Imitate God. Does God ignore sin? No. Not at all. God sees sin so serious that he dies on a cross. Because he sees that no payment can pay for it by just good behavior but there must be the payment of life, of blood, and he dies on a cross. And what does Paul say to us? Imitate God. Be willing to die, to sacrifice yourself, to love somebody else enough. In fact, if you look at the code of honor, and, and, and at this moment, I'm just going to go back to the uh, Air Force One, because too many of you are going to the Air Force Academy. <laughs> <clears throat> the Air Force Academy, in addition to the Code of Honor, has an oath. 
that you use when you're actually committing yourself to that code of honor. And the, here's the oath. We will not lie, steal, or cheat, nor tolerate among us anyone who does. Furthermore, I resolve to do my duty and to live honorably, and for those who choose to add this phrase, so help me God. I'm going to live honorably. I'm going to do this with the help and the power of God himself. How are we going to follow through with Ephesians 5? Unless we ask for the power of God. And that's why Paul started out by imitate God the Father. Love like God loves. Imitate his love. Give yourself, sacrifice yourself like Jesus Christ did. The Air Force Academy goes on and says to, to live under the code means this. Cadets are expected to report themselves for any code violation. Whoa. Let me be brave enough to do that. Courageous enough to say, I just blew the code. Oh, but wait a second. Isn't that repentance? Isn't that what the Spirit of God is trying to call out of every single one of us? Repent. Admit. Be honest about what is in you that is sin. Don't pretend it's not. Repent. And it goes on. Furthermore, they must confront any other cadet they believe may have violated the code and report the incident if the situation is not resolved. Now there's an interesting phrase, isn't it? So I find out, and I think that Chandler has um, cheated. Sorry. Sorry, Chandler. <laughs> and I go to Chandler, and I say, Chandler, I, 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 you know, I, I'm concerned. I, I, I saw something the other day. Sure looked like you were looking at um, Matt's paper when he was doing that test. And I'm concerned because that, that's what it looked like to me. Like you're kind of looking over there. Were you? And Chandler says, you know, maybe he admits it. Or maybe he says, hey, seriously, no, I, I wasn't. It may have looked like that, but I wasn't looking at his paper. I actually saw something on the floor ahead of his desk, and I was, was looking at that. I wasn't looking at him at all, and I'm sorry if it looked like that. But whatever. Chandler comes truthful to whatever it was, whether he's admitting it right or wrong. He's being honest. Now, do I need to now go report Chandler? No, I've dealt with it. Maybe Chanley even said, you know, I, uh, yeah, yeah, Bill, I was really tempted to look at Matt's paper, but as I started, no, I, I chose not to. Well, do I now report that? No, because I've dealt with Chandler, haven't I? I've gone to him straight away, and he's facing up to it. He's dealing with it in whatever way, right? Honestly. And that's the code of honor, isn't it? Don't I have a responsibility to go to brothers and sisters? Paul even says don't judge the outside world but judge brothers and sisters go to them it's part of the code of honor isn't it for us to be concerned about to trust because let me take you back to the code the code works because it's about trust and trust is critical to survival and it works because it's about accountability in the military, can you really go at it alone? Well, yeah, maybe if you're a sniper, maybe if you're sent out there by yourself behind the lines with no communication, no other, no way to communicate back, and they actually say, we're going to leave you out there, then, then I guess maybe you do it alone, but it's not really smart, is it? It's usually a death position. In the military, you go as a team. I think the military caught something from the body of Christ. And God calls us to go as a team and to be concerned. And so Paul goes in, an, in another part of Ephesians, says, he says, speak the truth in love to one another. There's that love principle again, isn't it? We have responsibility for each other. Are you living under the code? Let me walk you through Romans real quickly. In verse 17 it says, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Incidentally, have you heard the Roman road to salvation? 
It involves things like the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we confess our sins, uh, uh, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all right, unrighteousness. A Roman road is a very simple process of coming to God. But look, listen to this. Verse 24 says, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do whatever ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who, who what? Who practice them. Well, that's quite a list, isn't it? Anyone fit in there anywhere? Arrogant, boastful, insolent, gossip, slanderers, wicked, evil, lust for women, lust for men. I mean, any of those fit anybody here? Goes on chapter two. Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. Are you living the code? Because he's saying something pretty important here, isn't he? That he's going to repay us based on what we've done, whether we've lived his code or not. Chapter 3, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. <laughs> we all fit. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. We've all sinned, but there's a way to get free from the sin, and that's through Jesus Christ. Chapter 4, 7, and 8. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Which sin does Jesus not count against us? The sin that has been forgiven. Not the sin that we've denied and pretended wasn't a sin. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 17, for if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Romans 6, what shall we say, say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Right? Hey, the more I do wrong, the more forgiven I get by God. So let's do more wrong. By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. For the wage of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Matt, don't you dare go talk to Chandler because we don't want him to know that he's done something wrong. That's love? If you've just been listening to the first six chapters of Romans, it's saying that Chandler is going to die in his sin unless he gives it to Christ and that there's going to be judgment even for the believer who's going to keep sinning unless they turn that sin over to Jesus. 
And if Matt really loves Chandler, he's going to say something to him. Not in a haughty, mean-spirited, evil kind of way. But in a way that says, Chandler, I've messed up too. I'm not perfect, Chandler. But I love you enough, so, and I love you so much, brother. I'm going to talk to you about something I've seen in you. Are you living? Are you living? The code. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, this is chapter 7, 21, evil is right there with me. <laughs> is that anybody here? I'm thinking it's all of us. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. I really like to do what God says. But I see another law at work in me. It wages war against the law of my mind and it makes me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. This is Paul. This is the dude that really served Jesus. He dies for Jesus Christ and he says, there's this battle going on in me, but thanks be to Jesus who's going to set me free. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? And as it is written for chapter 9, see I lay a Zion, in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Imitate God. And God is like a stone. Jesus makes people stumble. Why? Because he's perfect and we're not. In chapter 10, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Are you living the code of honor? Romans 12, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. That means you may have to do stuff that's difficult, that's hard, that goes against the way you want to sin. Because I'm going to give my body to God instead of me. I'm going to live, be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, the good and pleasing and perfect will. Love must be sincere. And you have to realize that the next part of the verse says, hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. It's Romans 12, 9. And then verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What? With obedience, with doing Jesus' will. Romans 13, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Sometimes the world is saying that the church is focused on one sin and that's not what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying that all sin is a problem. Do something about it. Don't gratify it. Romans 15, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, are you living God's code? Are you live, or are you living your own? codes of honor. They, 
begin with each individual soldier, each individual cadet, each individual follower. Are you living the code of honor that Jesus has given to you? And if not, repent. Admit it. Be honest. Come to Jesus. God. Help us to imitate you. To know there's no one single sin that stands somehow above all the others. I realize you did say there is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and that sin, there is no forgiveness for that. And so I guess there is that one peace, God. But, but in a sense, blasphemy means to stand against you, God, rather than doing your will. To put someone else in as God over you. To worship another. Lord God, show us where we are giving in to sin in our lives. Help us to live for you, God. And understand that that involves love, love for you, enjoying the love you've given to us and loving one another. And loving each other with tough love that's willing to help another, hold another accountable. Help somebody be stronger and to do your will. Cleanse us today, God. And we thank you that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And may we not be condemning, but love enough to speak the truth. Speak the truth to us, Jesus, right now. If we have stuff in our life that we need to confess to you, God, draw it out of us. Help us as we conclude this worship today to honor you completely, regardless of the cost. In Jesus' name, amen.